Okay, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about bonds to generations. Uh, the first generation atomic bombs were huge, gigantic devices that were so big they could barely fit in the bomb bay of a B-52 bomber. Those, those are first generation bombs. Yes. Uh, second generation bombs are small MIRVs. You can put 10 of them in the nose cone of an MX missile. Right. Uh, these are called second generation bombs. Small bombs that are about three feet tall, two and a half feet tall. Oh. Third generation bombs are designer bombs. And they are now slowly being devised and talked about. In fact, the Bush administration wants to allocate money now for the third generation. Third generation bombs are designer bombs. Uh, they are specifically designed for various purposes, to be used in the desert, to be used underground, to be used in outer space, to be used in the jungle. Different designs of bombs for different purposes. These are called third generation. Uh -huh. The neutron bomb is a two and a half generation bomb. It's uh, between the second and third generation. It's often called a two and a half generation bomb. All right. And uh, as I mentioned, in 1991, uh, get a copy of Music Magazine in January, February of that year, just before the outbreak of hostilities. Uh, Music Magazine interviewed several senior Pentagon officials, and they laid out the option. Uh, the neutron bomb was an option. Uh, first, uh, they would hit Baghdad with the electromagnetic pulse. Uh, a bomb would be detonated over Baghdad. Uh, the pulse, the shock wave from the bomb would wipe out all the electronics, wiping out their surface-to-air missile defense system. You're not talking about, um, or are you talking about actually a very large bomb that made it very high, or? Uh... That's right. Uh, a conventional hydrogen bomb detonated over Baghdad, which would cause a shock wave. How far over Baghdad? Oh, you would have to do it several miles above the city, or else it would create, you know, heat and devastation from the yes. shock wave. Um, you know, the United States did this back in the 1960s. It sent a Thor missile up into space and detonated a hydrogen bomb in, in space. And much to our shock, uh, it created a shock wave which wiped out communications uh, to some degree between uh, San Francisco and Tokyo. It set off burglar alarms all over Hawaii. And uh, then we realized a new phenomenon had been discovered, the electromagnetic pulse. We had never seen that before. And so the military had suddenly realized that in case of a real war, if they had detonated that bomb, we would have wiped out our own satellites. Yes. Uh, we would have blinded ourselves uh, with the electromagnetic pulse. Uh, so anyway, the Music Magazine article lays out that first you hit Baghdad with a electromagnetic pulse weapon. Right. Uh, then you would hit conventional troop emplacements with a neutron bomb. Uh, the neutron bomb would then be used against conventional troop emplacements. I'm trying to get a sense of uh, the scope of a neutron bomb. How how wide an area could it virtually sterilize? Uh, it's a small atomic bomb, uh, about a kiloton's worth, uh, while the Hiroshima bomb was maybe 10 times that, 10 yes. 15 times bigger than that. So it's a sub-Hiroshima type bomb that does emit heat, does emit blast, but it's minimal compared to what a Hiroshima bomb emits. How big is it blast? Oh, it'd be quite devastating. If you hit it in a modern city, uh, you do considerable damage to the downtown area. Uh, not much more, but you'd, you'd knock out a large portion of the downtown area. And then beyond that, the radiation effects? Much less, much less, because most of the radiation is in neutrons. So this would be used against troop emplacements. Uh, hmm. If you have a concentrated number of troops, you hit him with a neutron bomb, and that's a kiloton of, of uh, power. Uh, realize that in the Iraqi war that many people saw on their uh, uh, TV screens, yes. we were talking about a 1,000-pound bomb or 2,000-pound bomb, okay? And now we're talking about uh, kilotons of TNT. Actually, there order, were... Several orders of magnitude. They were talking about tens of thousands of... Uh, uh, pounds, I believe, are equivalent to uh, NTNT, really a, a crazy giant figure, the, the Moab mother of all bombs or something. It was yeah, the mother of all bombs is, is, again, in the ton range. Right. Uh, however, a nuclear weapon would be in the kiloton, thousand ton range. So we're talking about a thousand times more than the mother of all bombs. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the neutron bomb packs a, a much bigger wallop than the mother of all bombs. Somehow, I always had it in my head that the neutron bomb virtually didn't even go boom. It just did this incredible radiation thing. Uh, no. No, uh, huh? It's basically a stripped-down hydrogen bomb. A hydrogen bomb has three layers. Uh, a fission layer in the center, and then 
Uh, we're talking about an extra uranium, I mean, lithium deuterite surrounding that. And then surrounding that is another layer of uranium. Well, then this breaks a giant myth, because the myth always was the neutron bomb was a totally clean thing to do and all. Well, it, it's quite messy. Quite messy. It has blast, it has heat, it has everything. It has all the, all the bad stuff of regular bomb, except huh. a lot of the radiation is in neutron form. So instead of a three-layer bomb, it's a two-layer bomb. You, you strip off the last uranium layer of a hydrogen bomb, and you get a neutron bomb. Basically. Wonderful. So, neutron bomb is a stripped down hydrogen bomb. So, it does create blasts, it does create lots of problems. And the Europeans hated it because uh, it was to be used on their cities. It, it was to be used on children places in their cities. And so, the Europeans realized there'd be nothing left of Europe if, hmm. if uh, the neutron bomb was set off. Uh, so, the neutron bomb still exists, and um, hopefully, it'll be, never be used in warfare. Uh, but it is a two and a half generation bomb because the third generation bombs are earth penetrators and uh, they're designed to detonate underground and you know like I said the Bush administration has already placed it in the budget that is being to, to, to kill underground bunkers that kind of thing yeah to collapse basically to, to bury uh, people that are underground in bunkers yes. uh, the, the North Koreans of course are definitely afraid of that because uh, most of the leadership is placed underground that's right and uh, so I think that's probably one reason why the Bush administration is developing you know. for, for these things specifically to, uh, to, to threaten the leadership of North Korea, which is basically underground. So these are third generation bombs, designer bombs uh, to be used in outer space as Star Wars, to be used on the, on the ground as neutron bombs, and to be used underground as nuclear earth penetrators and bunker busters. There are the professor who say that President Reagan's threat of Star Wars uh, brought down communism, or, you know, that's unfair, I guess, was, a, was at least um, a fairly large factor in the final collapse. Do you buy, do you buy into that? Well, um, Ronald Reagan was once interviewed by a journalist who asked him a question, you know, spinning Russia into a depression, that's always been the right-wing strategy, mm -hmm. spinning Russia into a depression. We build a bomb, they build a bomb. Yes. Well, um, the journalist asked, won't this backfire on the United States? Won't we be plunged into depression? And, you know, the president thought for a while, and then he said, maybe, but they'll bust first. Wow. Well, they bust first. And we could very well bust second. So uh, it was very clear, I think, you know, from Reagan's own quote, that he knew it was a game of chicken. Mm -hmm. that they were going to be spending themselves under depression, we're spending ourselves under depression, and who wins is the one who busts second. So Russia busts first. Uh, their, their commissars mistakenly thought that security meant building more bombs, which meant less potatoes on people's uh, dinner plates. Well, here's, here's what I always wondered about, Professor. Russia really, because it was kind of a failed economic plan, they could only continue to thrive by continuing to eat up territory, take more territory. If you've got a system that's not producing profit, you've got to keep that's the only way you can do it is take more territory. And it got to the point, I guess, where they couldn't do that without a suicidal act, but still there must have been that moment of horrid consideration on the part of the communists when they realized their system uh, couldn't expand at all because of the threat that they faced of extinction, uh, so they, they, they couldn't do that, but then again, they had all these weapons, and if ever there was going to be a time to use them, a dark, psychologically disturbed moment when they would make the decision to use them, that would have come somewhere in there just before they went belly up economically and said, we quit. Well, I think that the problem is the opposite. The problem with the Soviet Union was stagnation. Um, the see, capitalism is quite vibrant. In fact, so vibrant that uh, you know it does cause uh, inequities. Yes. But the Soviet system creates the opposite: stability. Stability is a point of stagnation. Yes. So it's not the expansion; it's the stagnation that was always a worry. And in order to get out of that stagnation, you have to have technology, and new ideas, and um, you know, entrepreneurial spirit, as, as Ronald Reagan would say. Yes. And uh, they, they lacked that. In fact, it got worse because they built so many bombs to catch up to the United States. You know, their economy was about a third, a third of the U.S. economy. And they were trying to match. They were trying to match our weapons. Sure. And that was the right-wing strategy, to lure, to lure the Russians to take potato off the dinner tables and 
to build weapons like the SS-18, uh, the SS-20, to match the MX, 